Hello and welcome to Data Disasters. I am Emily Kukier, a science librarian at Washington State University specializing in information in the life and physical sciences. Today I'll be talking about what can happen when data goes awry. Our story begins back in about 4th millennium BC in Babylonia, the modern day Iraq. This is where we have a candidate for the first ever human whose name has been preserved in writing. The characters Ku and Shim appear together on a set of clay tablets. These tablets tell us they are a Sumerian official with the title of Sangha. Ku Shim's job is to oversee some administrative activities for a storehouse that contains malt and barley. We don't know exactly what they were doing or what sorts of transactions they oversaw, but we do know that the quantities were very large. Now, given what people throughout history tended to do with very large quantities of malt and barley, uh, you've probably already figured out that Kushim must have been a very important person. Now, when I say administrator, what I really mean is accountant. Uh, Kushim's name appears on multiple tablets that describe amounts of malt and barley. This tablet here gives calculations of the amount of barley groats and malt needed to brew beer. Uh, the round dots and the bowl-shaped symbols describe quantities of each by volume. The more lined and hatched symbols are descriptive. Uh, we read the columns right to left to track initial quantities and then subtotals with a grand total in the column at the right. This particular tablet shows calculations of the amounts of ingredients needed to create nine different dry cereal products and eight kinds of beer. Translating this is a bit beyond me, but what we do know is there is a mistake in the upper left corner of the tablet. So reading right to left, uh, this half oval with tick marks tells me a quantity of barley as a raw ingredient. Uh, the hourglass figure in the next cell corresponds to a type of cereal product, and the half oval to its left represents the quantity of it that those barley groats will make. In this case, just one unit. However, the math is off here. To be correct, the far left symbol should actually be a dot representing 10 times as much as the half oval. So if I use Kushim's recipe as is, I'm going to have way more cereal than I can eat. I'll be eating Rice Krispie treats for days. The big takeaway here is that we have been recording numbers wrong for as long as we have been recording numbers. That means at some point in your life, you will make data mistakes, and that's inevitable. Don't let that get you down. Let it be liberating instead. It means that we know not to expect or rely on perfection from ourselves, so we can let go of that burden. Instead, we need to take responsibility to prevent and respond to errors appropriately, so we can set up practices that make errors less likely and catch them before they have a chance to cause harm. We can embrace a culture where reporting and learning from errors is normal, so instead of feeling like we have to hide them or pass the buck, we all accept system-wide responsibility for doing better next time. Here are some much more recent examples of how math and spreadsheet errors have had real-world effects. You'll see it's indiscriminate. Public institutions, private ones, big and little businesses, nobody is immune here. It can cost money, credibility, or reputation. And there are hidden costs whenever we rely on inaccurate information to make decisions. My point here is not to scare you, but to reassure you. There's almost no way you could make a data mistake as a student at WSU that would cost $6 billion. Please, nobody try to prove me wrong. Uh, most likely, whatever you do here is not going to be that bad. Here, you can take time and play around a little bit and get more comfortable working with data. And yes, you will make mistakes, but sometimes that's how we absorb the lessons the best, when we can see firsthand the consequences of what we've just done. Now, this next story is another one that has a really big consequence. Did you get to watch the Mars Perseverance rover land earlier this year? It was really fun, but also nerve-wracking. The people in the control room were really tense as the video of the descent played out, and so relieved when it made a perfect landing. There's a good reason they were nervous. Not all missions have gone so well. It takes a lot of calculations to send a vehicle remotely to another planet, and at that distance, a tiny mistake can compound itself drastically. Here's one example. The NASA Mars Climate Orbiter launched in December 1998. Its mission was to study Mars from orbit and serve as a communications relay. Now, this was back before there was video of the landing process. All we had back on Earth were data signals relayed back, and the last contact was in September of 1999, about nine months after the launch. The craft began its descent to Mars as planned, but stopped responding after it passed behind the planet. We had no idea what had happened until later in that day. 
So it turned out there was a problem with a small program being used to calculate navigation trajectories from the ground. The program was supposed to output results for how hard to fire correcting thrusters in newton seconds, those are metric units, rather than the English units of pound seconds. One pound is about four and a half newtons. So each time the ground sent the craft instructions to adjust its trajectory, it was assuming that what it sent was a lighter touch by a factor of about 4.5. So a gentle nudge became a really rude elbow. As the climate orbiter approached Mars, the team intended to put it in an orbit over 200 kilometers away. Instead, it arrived at about 57 kilometers away. The craft was unable to maintain an orbit at that altitude and wound up burning up in the Martian atmosphere. That was a really expensive mistake, both in terms of what the craft cost, almost $200 million, and the years of science that were planned to do with it. And it was all because of a unit mix-up. So the lesson you can take from this is that just sharing data as numbers isn't enough. Data need context so people interpret them correctly. The easiest way to provide this context is to make a file that's a lot like a software readme file. This could be a separate word or text document or just a fresh worksheet in Excel. It should make clear what all your units are, how you took the measurements, and whatever assumptions went into your process. Honestly, this is good practice even when you don't plan to share your data with someone else. 90% of the time, the person you'll help the most is you. When you come back to your data six months from now, you'll have laid out exactly what you did and tell yourself how to pick it up again. Plus, when you take the time to set those things out beforehand, it forces you to think a little harder about the decisions you make. Similarly, when you use someone else's data, don't forget to look at the documentation first. Don't be shy to ask them about things that you need to know to be able to use them properly. They shouldn't mind. If you use their data correctly, it benefits both of you. So now our story turns to Sherbeek, a district of the town of Brussels. Back in 2003, Sherbeek held an election where something unusual happened. On election night, when officials were counting up the votes, they found something that seemed impossible. A relatively unknown candidate got more votes from one polling area than could legally be cast in that polling area. This is bad! It calls the integrity of the entire election into question, so they start to investigate fast. The computer code seems fine. They check the results against the physical ballots and find everything is the same except for one discrepancy. In the paper ballots, this one candidate has about 4,000 fewer votes. Uh, that exact number is 4,096 fewer votes. Now, if you're into computers or math in general, that number may stand out to you. It's a power of 2, 2 to the 12th. And again, that might make you think of binary, which is the way numbers are stored in a computer. So it turns out a difference of 4096 is what would happen if you took a number written in binary and flipped the 13th digit from a 0 to a 1. Nothing else about the election data seemed off. So what could cause a single bit of a computer hard drive to change? We don't know for sure that this is what happened, but in the absence of any other explanation, what seems most likely is that it was a cosmic ray, which is a charged particle like an atomic nucleus or a high-energy proton that traveled through space and to the Earth, to Sherbeek, to the specific computer, and hit the hard drive at the exact spot where this candidate's vote tally was stored. Nuts, right? It sounds really, really improbable, but it's not impossible. So, is there a vast alien conspiracy to change our election results? Probably not. And frankly, the odds of a cosmic ray destroying your research results are pretty slim. You can't tell your professor that a bit flip ate your homework. But there's still a good lesson to learn here about the importance of backing up your data. The town of Sherbeek did a good job with this one. When they had data that didn't make sense, they had a backup they could check. Disaster averted. Now, there are tools out there today that make protecting your data really easy. It just takes a little bit of work up front, but then you're set and you don't have to think about it anymore. So the rule of thumb in data protection is three, two, one. You want to have three copies of your data on two different media and at least one of those off-site. When I say different media, I mean things like a hard drive, a DVD, or cloud storage. Off-site just means someplace other than where you do your main recording and storing of data, uh, and that can certainly include putting things in the cloud. Most people don't do this unless they've specifically thought about it, but these days it's not hard. You might keep one copy of your stuff on your hard drive, one on your OneDrive account, and a third with a cloud provider like a Google Drive or Dropbox, and then you're done. 
This goes for any data that's important to you and is going to be hard to replace. Another thing you might consider is data validation. This is when you set up a spreadsheet to warn you that certain inputs don't look right. It's like the Sharebeek vote tally. They could have set up the spreadsheets to give an error message if a candidate got more votes than were possible in a district. You can do things like uh, not allow negative numbers, to force numbers to fall within a certain set range, or only allow text that comes from a list of allowed words or phrases. This isn't for everyone, but it's worth learning more about if you use spreadsheets regularly. So this happened about 10 years ago. A London-based trader working for JP Morgan tries a new trading strategy for the Synthetic Credit Portfolio, which is a group of investment holdings that are meant to act as a money buffer if a bunch of the bank's customers can't repay their loans. His idea is to sell off insurance on low-risk investments to pay for insurance on high-risk ones. Sounds reasonable, right? Well, unfortunately, this ended up losing money overall. And early on, to try to stem the losses, he doubled down on his strategy but his competition got wise and started betting against him. This actually eventually earned him the nickname the London Whale because his trades were so large they were sending ripples throughout the market. As the losses started to pile up, his bosses got spooked and halted all of the trading from that portfolio. When the dust had settled, it had cost them $6.2 billion. Now, this sounds like a failure of strategy, and it was. But there was more going on behind the scenes that made that strategy much harder to pull off successfully. So going on, at around the same time, JP Morgan's modeling group developed a new method of calculating risks. This was for entirely good reasons. They were doing it to comply with new regulations. But unfortunately, there was pressure from management to make this work fast, which meant that they didn't do enough thorough testing, uh, and they had to cut some corners on what would otherwise be good data practice. So a report analyzing what went wrong said, the model operated through a series of Excel spreadsheets which had to be completed manually by a process of copying and pasting data from one spreadsheet to another. Now, this manual work was supposed to be done automatically, but that software creation work never got finished. And the manual work led to mistakes along the way. Later on, however, they found an even bigger problem. There was a mistake in a critical formula where some risks that were supposed to be average were being added together instead. Now, the way this worked through the math is that the model underestimated volatility by a factor of two. So that led the company to think that investments were safer and more stable than they actually were. So I'm not qualified to tell you what this means for a stock portfolio, but there are a couple of things you can do for your spreadsheets. For any kind of calculation or data entry you'll do regularly, it's worth your time to make a polished spreadsheet template. Every time you have to cut and paste or enter values by hand, you run the risk of a mistake. So make your template so you do as little manually as possible. That'll be faster and less error prone. Uh, another thing is to take more time with stuff that's really important. When the results mean a lot to you, double check that your spreadsheet is doing the calculations accurately under lots of conditions, not just the ideal ones or the first few you try. And lastly, you can get a leg up if you know what kinds of errors are likely to show up in spreadsheets. That way, when you're putting a spreadsheet together, you design your data entry and your data calculation process to minimize or avoid those problems. From some work by Powell et al., we know some types of errors are more common than others. Now, the most frequent one is called a hard coding error. This is where a spreadsheet formula is supposed to use a reference to another cell. But instead, you type the value of that cell directly into the formula. Now, if the value of the first cell changes, you have to remember to update the formula too. Every time you use that formula in the worksheet, every time you change that original value. Uh, one mistake can propagate very quickly, and spreadsheets can be, get really broken this way. The next most common is a reference error, where a cell or a range that's called out in a formula is not actually the one that was intended. Uh, and then there's logic errors, some mistake where a formula is not doing the math that was intended, like in the JP Morgan spreadsheet. There are other less frequent errors, like copy and paste errors, errors of omission, or typos in inputs. 
So this last story touches upon my own experience. Long ago, before I ever imagined becoming a librarian, I was a college student in a little town in Southern California. Unbeknownst to me, my school had negotiated a discount plan with the local power company that allowed the power company to ration or turn off power completely during times of high demand. Now, this should almost never happen, but one particular year it became a regular issue. In the evening, without warning, the dorm computers and the lights would all just shut off. On the worst days, it would happen even earlier in the day. The chem labs all had to shut down. No fume hoods. Lectures were canceled or moved to the activity center where there was more natural light, and professors drew out their lectures on giant pads of paper set on easels. I learned to try to get my computer homework done early so I could do OCHEM work later with a pencil and paper by flashlight. Not that we did much work when the lights went out. People came out of their rooms. We hung up giant sheets of paper and finger-painted our walls. We sang and danced around the courtyard. People who played instruments would pull them out and give concerts. The emergency response volunteers would break out the aging glow sticks and thermal blankets. Most of the stuff was expired anyway, so it was a good excuse. And it was cozy. I have lovely memories of the care and the community that formed around those times. But it was also a waste of my tuition dollars. And it was all a sham. Years later, we learned that private power companies were artificially creating shortages and misallocating power deliberately to drive up demand and profit off of the desperation prices the local power plants had to pay for electricity. So here's to you, Enron. Now I'm going to get my revenge by throwing shade on all your spreadsheets. In 2015, a pair of academics got their hands on a trove of Enron documents, over 15,000 spreadsheets and 65,000 emails from the company's archives. And they started looking for issues. Now, they couldn't always detect things like typos. You need more context or knowledge of the right answers to find those out. But they ran some automated analyses for other things that could indicate problems, and they came up with some interesting things. What they found was that Enron spreadsheets, on the whole, had a lot of errors. Here, we're counting the errors that Excel flags with a pound symbol in front of them. Now, almost a quarter of Enron spreadsheets that contained formulas had at least one visible pound sign error. Enron spreadsheets also incorporated more risky behaviors than you would expect to find in your average pile of spreadsheets. Mostly, these are things that make formulas look complicated, which can make it hard to detect logic errors. These are things like long chains of letters and numbers that spill across a lot of lines of text, refer to a bunch of different cells, or have a whole bunch of nested if statements in them. The authors call these practices smells, or weak spots in spreadsheet design. Basically, the more smelly a spreadsheet is, the more likely it is to have a mistake in it. So, if you're going to be using spreadsheets for calculations, you want to break complicated formulas down into a series of steps done by individual cells. That will make it easier to find and fix calculation errors. If there isn't room to do this, think about moving that part to a separate tab in the spreadsheet and just put the beginning and the final numbers of the calculation back where you need them. It's a good ha to get into the habit of storing numbers that get updated as variables or in separate cells, not hard coding them into formulas like we talked about. You may also want to learn about the difference between absolute and relative cell referencing. This is a common source of referencing errors. Lastly, use comments to help yourself and others know what's going on when you make a calculation. This could be directly in the spreadsheet or in a separate page, like the one with your units and assumptions in it. But lastly, and perhaps more importantly, a fair number of the Enron emails were specifically about issues that people had with the spreadsheets. Finding errors, having trouble double-checking them, or pointing people to the most recent version. There's a sense that overall, the company did not value the integrity of their spreadsheets. Or integrity of any kind, really. But you want to have high standards for your spreadsheets. Not about how pretty they look, but about how reliable they are. And you want to bring this attitude to others you work with so the whole project runs smooth. Often the same attitude towards following the rules, or not, from the company leadership in general will percolate down into the everyday details as well. If your boss cares more about the spreadsheet showing them the numbers they want, rather than doing calculations right, that suggests you've got bigger cultural problems. 
So to recap things, I've talked about the inevitability of making mistakes. Rather than trying to be perfect, we learn to adopt behaviors that make mistakes less likely next time and focus our energy where mistakes would lead to bigger consequences. Adopting those behaviors includes things like listing what you and others need to know to use your data correctly, and setting up systems that protect your data from accidental loss or corruption. You can help yourself avoid mistakes by knowing which ones are most likely to show up and how. Train yourself on how to use self-referencing correctly and make complicated calculation chains into a series of simpler ones. And last but not least, good data practices benefit everyone, and it's everybody's responsibility to build them. Thank you everyone for your attention. Please feel free to reach out if you have any questions or with data disaster stories of your own that you'd like to share.